Hi, this is John Sobate, and welcome to Art and Design with Dylan Dunbar. Dylan, hey, is this your first book? It is, actually. Um, I actually wrote three, technically, um, over the past year and a half, and this is the first one on deck to come out. And I picked this one to make it a little easier to learn all my first book lumps and uh you know rumble strips and hurdles so i figured it would be easier to get something out and get a horse in the race while i can uh continue editing the other two books i have which should be out later this year but, okay what was the impetus what was the thing that made you say you wanted to write a book well um honestly it was uh sobriety really um i'm about three and a half years uh sober now and um, was after about the first two years that I realized that nobody told me that quitting drinking was the easy part, that um, you have all these feelings that you have to deal with now and staying sober is the hard part. And that's what takes all the work. So I ended up in a therapy, uh, which I highly recommend to anybody that's trying to overcome anything or just wants it anyways. Um, she gave me, my therapist gave me all these exercises to start journaling and to start writing, um, these essays. And I took to it and was like, wow, this is, I really enjoy doing this. Um, it's giving me this dopamine fire that would happen when I would be playing on stage or anything like that. So I figured, you know what, let me, let me try my, uh, let me try this and let me see how far I can go. Um, I looked at my wife and was like, hey, I think I want to be a published author. And um, a year and a half later, I've got a book coming out. So basically, it was uh, sobriety that kind of started the whole thing and uh, gave me a new avenue to go down that I really enjoy. Okay, so you have... Uh your book release is actually this week. I think it's Wednesday night. Yep. Right? So we're going to do Thursday. a commercial for that. Thursday, the ninth. And what are the details? Um, it's at, um, it's called uh, Bell's Lounge and it's actually inside Valentine Distilling over there on Vester in uh, Ferndale. Um, it is, doors are at seven and um, I'll have my books, um, book signing, I have my brother who also does uh, photography. He will have some prints for sale. Um, I have Dead Fred, who is on the cover of the book. Um, I lucked out. This is actually one of my brother's photog photographs. And he knows the, the actor that uh, dresses up as Dead Fred. So he will actually be at the signing in full zombie, walking around so you can get your book and a picture with Dead Fred from the cover. And uh, tickets are ten dollars uh, online at Go Passage, and um, twelve dollars the day the day of uh, if you walk in, and a twenty dollar ticket gets you a signed book. So, huh? That's a deal. It is. <laughs> it is. Also, also one more thing. Um, my wife and I will be playing with the full band, which doesn't happen ever since my surgery. Um, I uh, still have this finger still pins and needles from a crushed ulnar nerve, which I had surgery last September, which actually kind of put the book thing into go mode. Like once this happened, I was like, well, maybe it's time I should focus on this right now to kind of keep the creative juices flowing. So um, the wife and I have a new album coming out uh, later this year, and we will be playing some of that new music with the full band. Also on Thursday night, along with the book signing, the zombies and photography, it's just going to be a big party. It's going to be great. All right. So at this point, we have to put a little uh, a commercial break in for the band because uh, uh, tell us about the band. Well, the band is my wife and I. Um, that is Jennifer Westwood, who is um, uh, who wrote a killer record. And we have <clears throat> musicians with us that are killer. Uh, we've got Chuck Bartels. We've got Dave Bilo. We've got Mark Lotus. <clears throat> so we'll have a five piece. We'll have keys, bass, drums, myself on guitar. 
and uh, Jennifer will be singing. And we have a new record called uh, Madman's World, which will be out later this year. And we'll be performing music from that new record as well. So, and you can find all that on jenniferwestwood.com as well. All right. See, I had to have that commercial break in there. So this works out perfect. <laughs> awesome. So this this Thursday is the book release. $20 gets you a book and it gets you into the event. And the band is per- performing live as well. So Correct. bonus round. Correct. And, uh, and don't forget Dead Fred. That's right. You can get Dead Fred too. <laughs> All right. Now I got to ask you back to the book. Um, knowing now... Uh, what it takes to put it through, what advice would you have for a budding off author? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, just keep writing, just keep doing it and visualize what it is that you want to do. Cause there's nothing wrong with visualizing. Um, visualize that you want to be successful at what it is that you do. Keep writing. Um, there's so much stuff that I'm even still learning. Um, but seriously, just just keep writing and don't worry about the naysayers and things that are like, well, you can't do this or you're going to fail at that or or maybe you should do it this way or do it that way. Just just keep writing and have people that you trust in your corner to be beta readers and you can bounce your ideas off of and get feedback. Uh, that's really the building blocks, I think, of starting off being successful writer, I think, so far. <laughs> uh, because it, the first step is the hardest step. Uh, I, I think yep. it's amazing in a short period of time that you were able to accomplish this to actually be holding a physical. So yeah. with that being said again, too, what is the book about? Well, it's a collection of uh, eight stories. Um, and I'm a big fan of authors such as uh, Richard Matheson, who was kind of like the king of short stories. Um, he did the a lot of the Twilight Zone stuff. Um, he did I Am Legend. Um, he's known for just being a, uh, an amazing uh, short story author. And then Robert McCammon, who was another horror uh, author that I grew up who's still alive today, but I grew up in the 80s and 90s just devouring his books. So that's where I take my inspiration from. And the stories are very, um, there's a lot of dark humor. Um, There's a lot of macabre. um, There's some twists. um, Very Twilight Zone meets Tales from the Dark Side. uh, Black Mirror. um, And it's eight stories that go through everything that are from the disgruntled worker that hates his job to um, there's even a a zombie apocalypse story that takes place in an automotive call center so if you've ever worked in corporate america and worked in a cubicle that's uh one that story's for you um um, there's a lot of things that i've learned from um all the travels my wife and i have done uh, touring so some of the places have um, places we've been and things that we've seen i've kind of all incorporated all of that into my storytelling so we have seen so much of the united states so i'm using that as some of the backdrop for a lot of my stories is through experience and things that i've seen and um, things that we've done so it's kind of a little bit of everything everything i've been through so hey you want to do a little sample reading oh sure sure i have no idea this is this is catching you from left field. Just thought you want to give it a little shot. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's a good one. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. I should know this by now because I need to start doing um, some readings. So let's start here. Um, try to pick, pick the right one here. Let's see here. Hey, this is a premiere. I know. I like this. I know. I know. (laughs) All right. 
here is I do have a story that um, does take place um, in Detroit in Indian Village um, about a couple that purchased a home on Seminole Street and they discover a painting in the basement and that painting is of the Nan Rouge. So if you are a Detroit history nerd, you know what our little macabre Nan Rouge is. So here we go. Beverly got up around 2 a.m. and left her husband snoring by himself on their queen size bed. The stairs lightly squeaked under each of their feet, each of her feet. She tiptoed across the first floor and into the living room. There she clicked on the Tiffany lamp and then sat next to the couch, sat, sat on the couch and sat down and waited for her eyes to adjust. She smiled and pulled her legs up Indian style as she sat on the couch. It was as if the painting had called her down. There was something it wanted to tell her, some kind of secret that only she would know. A low hum began to ring in her ears. Beverly reflexively stuck her pinky in one of her ears to correct anything that might be causing her to hear this droning. Meanwhile, she couldn't hear, she couldn't keep her eyes off the painting. Reds and oranges seemed to swirl in front of her. It was as if the river was flowing across the canvas. The hum now became much louder. She tried to stick her finger in her ear once more, but she couldn't. She could move her eyes, but nothing else on her body responded to what she wanted to do. Her eyes darted around the room, looking for something that could help her. Panic was now blazing across the highways of her brain. The loud rumble now became a deep roar. Even though Beverly found herself unable to move, she could still feel the sweat that was now soaking into her nightgown and beating on her forehead, giving her a cooling sensation. This let her know that she wasn't completely paralyzed. However, she, she quickly realized that she could also still feel pain. The roar stopped and everything went quiet. In a flash, her head snapped back and forced her to look straight up at the ceiling. The pain was excruciating as if her head was being yanked from her body by her own, by an unknown force. Every tendon in vertebrae overextended itself and sent daggers to pain receptors throughout her brain. A tear ran down her cheek and she tried to push out a scream, but she couldn't. Her mouth forced itself open. So far it dislocated. There was nothing she could do but feel every inch of her body rampaging with agony. She could still look at the ceiling, but that was becoming difficult as her eyes watered heavily from the pain. A warm jet of air blew past her gums and pushed itself down her throat, forcing itself through her windpipe and into her lungs. She was completely defenseless and immobile. All she could do was take in the pain and wait for it to be over. Ah, hey, nice work. Thank totally you. ambush on that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But hey, roll with the punches, hey, man. I think you're doing great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, will you be reading on Thursday as well for the uh, dedication? I might. Um, I might. It's all new. This is all baby steps, man. I'm yeah. dipping a toe. You know? uh, so, we got but started I, here. I did. And <laughs> I probably will. I probably will do a reading. You know? Might be uh, what I just I, read, but hey. <laughs> hey, that's okay. At least you read it. So, right. yeah. <laughs> so I, I have another question for you, too. And uh, If I recall, didn't you have a white van at one time for the band? Yes. Um, Betty White. Um, yes, that was the white van. Um, yes. And ironically... It's the story, the book's called Free Candy, and there's the title story, Free Candy, is about a disgruntled clown that drives around in a van. So, Just a hunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did uh, Betty White have that written on the side door? There, Almost. Okay. Almost did. <laughs> Almost. We tried many different things with Betty White. Even We even put tinfoil. One time I put tinfoil in the windows because uh, we were out in L.A., and uh la the the homeless in la is just everywhere and they don't seem to mess with them so you could just park your van anywhere and if you have a 
if your van built out to sleep in and live in, um, it was perfect. So I put tin foil in the windows so no one would bother us because it made us look homeless. <laughs> but it worked. It, it worked great. Old Betty White. Is it isn't tin foil the universal for? They're crazy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the universal. Leave me alone. Go the other way. Yeah. Yes. For sure. Wait. I'm excited about the book because you've got all these different settings and you guys have been touring relentlessly for the last, mm -hmm. what, 20 years. So yep. uh, I, I think it's great. And to take from all those experiences and utilize those through this project, if you will, because this is uh, your recent incarnation as a writer. And I say that in all the right ways, hopefully, um, which is amazing. Because again, you've got a physical book in front of you that you just accomplished, and it's one of many that are uh, slotted. Right. So, I don't know. I'm excited about it. I Thank think it's you, amazing. Man. Thank you. Especially, Thank you. You know, congratulations because Thank this you. is a big step. And Thank you. Um, I hope this is taken in the correct context too. But it's therapeutic, isn't it? Very, extremely. I had no idea. I mean, you could kind of almost say that uh, writing has pretty much saved my life um the therapy the therapy and um what it does for the brain is 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 just amazing um i'm gonna name drop briefly here but when i first started writing um i had mentioned to a friend of mine who uh pretty much became my mentor um you i'm sure you know of a band called the mugs um danny mugs was kind of my uh, sensei when I first wrote my first 12,000 words, I sent it to him and was like, um, let me know if I should quit or if I should keep going. And he was uh, like, no, you have to keep going. And he kind of beat me up um, pretty hard, which is what I asked him to do. I wanted him to be brutal because if I, you know, can't take his, his reviews, how am I going to take people on Amazon? I mean, they can be brutal. Um, so he really whipped me into shape. And I, you know, he helped me tremendously. And then I had sent early on, I had sent my um, first story to uh, Josh Mallerman. And he's an old acquaintance of mine. And he actually gave me some great feedback. and was like, keep going. Um, this is great. And you're right. Writing is this superpower that um, fills your brain full of um, happiness i guess <laughs> is the best way to put that so yes it's like learning an instrument it's like playing it's like everything all over again um you know, it's like i'm a teenager playing guitar in the basement you know you you're missing that um that whimsical carefree um, fun and up and down where everything is not so jaded yet you know if that makes sense yes it does but on, on that note that you just made, the importance of uh, having a mentor and being a mentor, since yes. you are going to be a mentor for someone soon, right? Um, if you aren't already, I don't, I don't, I'm taking liberties here, but <laughs> the whole thing is they were important in your development. And yes. can you speak to mentorship and how important it is in the writing? Um, it's huge because if you don't have the feedback or someone to show you some things, you don't necessarily know which direction you're going in, um, whether or not it, it's, you need that positive reinforcement, but you also need the, you know, the critique. You need someone to tell you no. You need someone to tell you um, maybe you shouldn't do that. You can do a little better. Uh, someone to, to push you but not in a way that is um, heavy handed. They're pushing you in a positive way. They're lifting you up. They're, they're, they're telling you what you shouldn't do, but also giving you feedback on what is good as opposed to some angry parent that's just saying, you're not good enough, you can do better. Um, the mentor kind of takes you on and teaches you the things that they've learned and um, put you in a direction in a more positive way. So it is essential, even with music, even with art, even painting, welding, anything that I think that's creative, a mentor is just crucial. And 
it really helps you get on the correct path in the direction that you uh, visualize you see yourself going. So uh, mentor, find yourself a mentor. That's, you know, number one. Anyone starting anything out. Well, and and on that same note, what is the space in which you write? How do you prep to sit down and start putting words to paper? Well, I kind of, um, there are really two ways, um, I, I, I believe, and I, I'm sure I'm getting this wrong, but um, there's really two ways to do things when it comes to writing. You have the people that will create a storyboard and do kind of like a flow chart and create characters and scenarios and kind of map their, their, their writing out. And then there's the people that just sit down, open the program and just start typing. And those people are kind of insane. Um, and that's pretty much what I do. Um, my favorite author of all time in my top, well, in my top five is Cormac McCarthy, who wrote No Country for Old Men and Blood Meridian and The Road. And he used to write in a chain of consciousness. So he would just sit down and just start writing. And he would have a general idea of where the story is going to go. But, uh, you know, points A, B, and C, he didn't know how to get to C. He just knew point A and point C. And then the rest he just you know, wrote as he went. And that's kind of how I do it. I have an idea in my head. And I will just start blazing out words and ideas for a story. I'm not worried about punctuation. I'm not worried about anything. I just blaze through and then I will go back and mold the clay and shape it into a story. Um, and that can take a year. The idea you can have, you know, you can write your story within like a week, if not less, but the editing and the massaging and the sculpting it can take quite a while especially to get it to where you want it to be. So at first, I just kind of jump off the cliff willy-nilly, start writing, and then I go back uh, a few days later, if not a week or two weeks later, and be like, okay, what did I write? And then I start going through it and molding it into that vase from just an ashtray on, you know, of clay, if that makes sense. Is that a ghost reference? It is. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> so, what uh, you mentioned this, there's a couple on the horizon. Do you want to yes. get into a little of that? And um, I have um, a novella, uh, which I had, I have just finished, um, which is called Sex Bomb, which is about uh, Tom Jones and uh, Billy Preston in the 1970s, Vegas, and their vampire hunters. So it's quite humorous. That's the kind of over the top. I mean, it's, it's not Jones. unusual. Yeah. Exactly. And then I have a full novel, which is a werewolf story. Um, that is my It's 90,000 words. It's 300 and some pages. It's something I've been really working on. And I'm in the final end of it, and it takes place in the 80s, and you're going to have Navajo Indians, werewolves, and Nazis. So it's every Gen Xer's dream Something that for we everyone. grew up with in the year. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's our generations, everything. It's jumping the shark for a Gen Xer. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. You mentioned this uh, when we were talking about um, free candy, too, is the dark humor is there. Right. Yes. So, <laughs> yes, I think that's the north, the Midwestern, and you know, Southeast Detroit or Southeast Michigan, the Detroiter in us that you know we're pretty cynical about just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did uh, didn't we say something? Wasn't there like a motto for Detroit art community? I thought you and I talked about this at one time. We probably did, and it was probably along the lines of like uh, Detroit eats their young. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Saying that for years. <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah, 
I, I mean, that is just pure entertainment, too. <laughs> so you got to be strong in the creative community. You, you do. Take a punch. You too. It's it's like the Badlands out there. You know, it's apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dylan, I'm really excited that we're talking about this. Thank you. But one more time, we got to do a little commercial um, okay. before we go about what we can expect again on Thursday. See, I, I got to circle back around. And That's make sure awesome. I, I appreciate it. Um, so Thursday is in at Valentine Distillery at the Bell's Lounge in Ferndale. It's right behind the Magic Bag on Vester. Doors are at 7 p.m. Um, the band will play around 8.15. Um, it's $12 a walk-in for a ticket. You can go to gopassage.com and look up the event. Um, Dylan Dunbar, free candy book release, and you can get advanced tickets. $10 gets you in $20. will get you in and a signed book, or you can buy a book there. However you want to do it. Um, so $12, if you're just walking in and doors are at seven, it's at Valentine in, um, Ferndale and it's going to be a blast. There's going to be art books, music, and a live zombie wandering around. So have yourself a delicious cocktail and, you know, hang out with a zombie. What more could you want? I I couldn't think of a better book release, Brian. Right? That sounds Seriously. really good. <laughs> Seriously. And it's all my yeah. wife's doing. It's all it's all Jennifer's oh. doing. She's been kind of my publicist for this whole thing because I sit around with my thumb up my butt and write <laughs> stories. So Well, there's no better publicist than her when it comes I to agree. marketing and promotion. Oh. I she's agree. on the top of my list. Uh, she is. She is unbelievable. She, she really is. Stop. So, and couldn't have a better person in your corner with all of this. I couldn't. Stuff. So, I couldn't. No, this is great. Well, and it's going to be is. fun. It will and, be. And, and again, it's this coming Thursday, and yep. I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be great. Yep. Dylan, thanks yep. for coming on the Art thanks, Design man. Show. I appreciate it. All right, it. brother.